Okay, so it seems we're good to go. Um, firstly, my neighbours have decided to do some home refurbishments today, so uh, that was nice. Um, so if you hear some banging around, I'm really sorry, and I guess um, we can all relate to this. Uh, so house rules really quickly, uh, please do stay on mute and camera off to help us connect better. Also, throughout the whole conversation with Jess and Aditi, feel free to use the Q&A chat box, top right hand corner. If you want to ask any questions to Aditi as Jess is talking, she'll try to get to them. Or you could wait until the Q&A, which will be happening about half an hour into the chat. We're hoping to have you guys for about 45 minutes, um, so do stick with us. So let's kick things off. I'm Jo, I head up our marketing here at Whaler. Um, and today's host is Jess Van Wick. Uh, Jess is our Senior Client Manager for Fashion and Beauty at Whaler. And our special guest is Aditi Meyer, photojournalist, creator, and sustainability consultant. So some of you may know that tomorrow marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And if you're unfamiliar, Earth Day is the largest one day civic movement. And for this Earth Day, Whaler are launching the Change Collective with Aditi Meyer as one of our founding creators. The Change Collective is a creator marketplace that connects brands with creators dedicated to using their influence and creative skills to affect positive change on issues such as sustainability, equality, health and safety. Ahead of tomorrow's official launch, we'd actually like to share with you, and this is the first time anyone's seeing it, even some of the people in our team, our video. super pumped about that we're really excited to launch this project particularly during the pandemic and so alongside Aditi are 58 other influencers who are creating content for Earth Day to show their commitment to change and I'd like to now hand you over to Jess and Aditi to introduce themselves and dive into today's discussion on the power of purpose-driven influence so Jess over to you Hi everyone, um, firstly thank you so much for joining. Uh, just to give a bit of background on the Change Collective, it's actually been in the making for a while now. Um, as I'm sure most of us do, a few years ago I felt I lacked a sense of purpose in my life and I found this purpose after watching The True Cost on Netflix. Um, the True Cost is a documentary that pulls back the curtain on the fashion industry and explores the clothes we wear, the people who make them and the impact that the industry has on our planet. And the feeling I had after watching uh, this documentary was probably very similar to the light bulb moment that many people feel when just before they become vegan. And I knew I wanted to do something about it, but having not studied anything along these lines, I did feel I was a bit limited. So I decided to complete a few online courses in fashion sustainability with UAL and after completing those courses I saw just how much our culture needs to change in order for the industry to change and working at Whaler where we have thousands of influential and inspiring creators on our platform I recognized this potential to use this influence for good and at scale um, and this is when the Change Collective was born and as Jo mentioned, Aditi is one of the collective's first members, um, and that's because of her ongoing and incredible commitment to the sustainability space. So over to you, Aditi, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Jess. Yes, hi everyone, my name is Aditi Meyer. Um, I've been in the sustainability space for a little over six years now. Um, so I'm a sustainable fashion blogger and a sustainability consultant. So I help brands really craft not only the stories and messaging around their sustainability campaigns, but how to show, not tell. 
um, as we're going to talk about in our call today, I feel like as much as the sustainability conversation is growing, there's also a lot of critique of brands that feel like they have failed to miss the mark um, through the consumer's eyes. Um, so beyond content creation and the brand realm, I also work as a photojournalist covering issues of labor and the environment. And I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Fab, well, thank you. Um, to start it off, I think it'll be super helpful if you define what sustainability means to you, just because it is such a complex term with so many definitions and understandings. Yes, most definitely. For me, I would say sustainability is about interrogating how our current systems are affecting our planet, um, its people, and culture, and kind of reimagining a way that we could meet the demands of today without sacrificing tomorrow's needs. Um, with that said, that can encapsulate anything from making sure that workers on supply chains are being compensated fairly, uh, considering the materials used, but also kind of looking at the overall messaging that exists in our culture today. I think we also, beyond just planet and the people, have to think about how are we often promoting these ideas of mindless consumerism and just scale that is not inherently sustainable. Um, so for me, sustainability is not only about lesser impact, but positive impact. Yeah, amazing. And for you, which aspect of sustainability is most important? Yeah, I think it's tough to compartmentalize just mm -hmm. because how we see everything intersects. The environmental very much is tied to the social. But for me, I would say a lot of my work at present um, really deals with workers' rights. So that's one priority for me. But I will say each consumer has a different set of priorities, whether that's the environment, animal rights, um, workers' rights. But I think for me, uh, my last six plus years in this space have really shown me how every issue is interconnected in some way or form. Yeah, it's also circular. Right. Um, was there a light bulb moment for you that got you into this conscious line of work? Yeah, so it's funny you ask because it is going to be the seventh anniversary of the event that kind of catalyzed my work in the space, and that was the Rana Plaza factory collapse. So although this week we are celebrating Earth Day, um, Earth Day also coincides with Fashion Revolution Week. And so Fashion Revolution Week was created um, after the 2013 Rana Plaza factory collapse. So the Rana Plaza factory collapse was an eight-story garment factory in Bangladesh that was producing for some of the world's biggest fast fashion brands. And the day before the factory collapsed, they found structural cracks in the building and it was ordered to evacuate. But there was so much pressure from upper management to have garment workers complete orders that they were called back into work. And when we think about the demographic that often makes up garment workers, they don't often have the luxury of forgoing a day's wage. And so this collapse, which killed over 1,100 people, injured over 2,500, is literally considered the biggest industrial disaster of our time. But for me, really thinking about all that happened leading up to the collapse and how it was essentially avoidable is what really catalyzed my work to think about if I wanted to occupy a space in fashion, how can I reimagine that to be more inherently sustainable and inherently ethical? Yeah, completely. Um, I think that was also a moment for me. It's it's a huge part of the documentary that I was talking about earlier, and it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a real moment of realization that we've all been part of uh, this event in some way or the other. Um, and talking about fast fashion, because obviously fast fashion brands were were part of this. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard it so many times before that fast fashion brands can't be sustainable just because the very nature of their business model, it goes against every def definition of the word. But it is a pretty scary thought of where the world is headed if these fast fashion giants don't drastically change. So do you feel that fast fashion brands can exist and still be a part of the sustainable movement? Yeah, um, that's a tough question. And I think there's a lot of nuance within that and it depends who you ask. Mm -hmm. For me, I think fast fashion's predication on speed and scale alone makes it very hard to be sustainable. Because fast fashion is predicated on speed, it often comes at the expense of garment worker safety, as we've seen, quality, and the environment. But at the same time, we have to reconcile that 
fast fashion brands, whatever changes they make in their supply chain have huge implications, especially for um, you know the livelihood of garment workers and the environment alone. And so something that I haven't seen fast fashion brands do, which I would love to see, is really grapple with the idea of growth, or maybe degrowth, I should say, thinking about producing at a lesser scale. Um, I think the way the market has operated thus far has often been an assumption about the demand in the market and thus creating some sort of supply, correct? But like, that is something that I think we need to challenge. Um, something that comes to mind is in 2018, there was a lot of negative press that arose when a lot of brands were found to destroy unsold merch. And this was with fast fashion brands to luxury brands. Mm -hmm. And I think what this really illuminated was there's a shift in consumer culture and what people are choosing to buy but also the way that brands were often disposing of unsold merch was primarily through burning and shredding and this has huge um, environmental implications when we think about carbon emissions and then the third most common form of getting rid of that sort of merchandise was landfills um, and so i think brands could really use this moment in time to grapple with what sort of scales they want to be producing at yeah, great, great answer. Thank you. Um, and talking about these brands, I think a lot of them are heritage brands or older brands that their supply chains are very much established already. So making changes is probably a lot more difficult for newcomers. Mm -hmm. um, for you, what are the first few steps that brands can take into addressing these issues of sustainability? Yeah. Well, as you said, the nature of supply chains is so inherently messy, especially for brands that have been around for a while. But I always say that supply chain transparency and traceability is one of the most important steps a brand can take. And by traceability, I mean a brand can identify, track, and trace elements of a product as it moves to through a supply chain from raw goods to finished products. This is important because Opaque supply chains are really what allow exploitation to thrive when you don't know where your products are coming from. And the Rana Plaza incident that I previously mentioned, that also catalyzed Fashion Revolution Week, which we are currently in, the only fashion week that will not be canceled this year. Um, <laughs> and Fashion Revolution Week is a global call for consumers to ask, who made my clothes? Um, it's a hashtag you might have seen on social media of people kind of showing the tag of their garment and asking where did this come from? So this is a movement that has grown exponentially in the years to come. And I think for brands, it's a very critical moment to be able to point to their whole supply chain and mm -hmm. say, while we might not have all the answers and we start still are in the process of making sure it's inherently sustainable and ethical, just the fact that you can identify your supply chain is huge. Yeah, great. Um, and when brands do contact you for work, do you have a bit of a checklist that you go through before agreeing to that work? Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. Most, first and foremost, is labor practices for me. I think just my um, genesis in this space was always kind of rooted in workers' rights. Um, so there's that. I'm mm. also keen to see the environmental progressions a brand has committed to. Um, I'm aware that you know it is a process, but I do want mm -hmm. to see what steps are in place. Um, yeah. Something that I particularly do, given that my platform is inherently critical about the industry, and so I kind of have to vet out my brands a bit more, is looking at a brand's history, what sort of scandals y'all have had. I do very <laughs> much. Um, and also parent companies is something that has arisen. I think the nature of a lot of brands today are owned by a parent company. And a major conversation that has arose in my own audience is, okay, if you are supporting this brand that has th these sorts of ethos, but they're owned by a parent company, that owns other companies that might have conflicting ethos, how do you navigate that? Mm -hmm. And it, it's something that is very tough because I know the way that these brands often operate is like their own existing subsidiaries. But I think parent companies also have a responsibility in this point of time to think about what are some of the conflicting messages here? Um, yeah. Something that happened in the past, I could kind of share a vague anecdote, um, was I worked with a beauty brand that who whose parent company also owned a skin lightening brand. And okay. so that was not something that was received well with my audience. And that was a huge learning moment for me is that I also have to think about the parent company mm -hmm. and the implications of that because consumers are becoming very smart to call out those sorts of discords. Interesting. So there's so many layers then of 
research that you yourself need to do yeah. before sort of agreeing to anything. Sure. Um, I, I guess you've already answered this question, but I think you know we're all we're all trying our best to do what we can for the planet that we we naturally do slip up. Would you classify yourself as a purist? Yeah, I mean, I would say maybe a realistic purist. Is that a thing in the sense that I think all actors need to come on the table. Um, as much as my platform is rooted in elevating sustainability, I'm also very vigilant about the ways that I want to preach beyond the choir. Um, I think sustainability needs touch points and gateways for folks to enter the movement that might not have all that knowledge. And so mm -hmm. that's something I'm actively thinking about is if I confine myself to only working with you know, small sustainable brands, as great and e as easier as that is for me on the research end, I really want to see bigger brands come to the table um, and have more raw conversations of where they are, what struggles they're facing, because I think that sort of transparency is something that audience is are more receptive to at this point in time, rather than pretending yeah. that you have all the answers as well. Yeah, it's I think that approach is a lot more relatable because we we all are humans we we can't all be perfect um yeah it, yeah, it is about being on a bit of a journey mm -hmm. and i'd imagine that since you are very outspoken in this space about environmental and social issues your followers will hold you to a much higher standard and they will call you out if you deviate from anything ethical or sustainable um yeah and i yeah oh sorry go on <laughs> i was just i was gonna say that um I think that that's often a fear that brands have, that if they do enter this conscious space that consumers will put them under a magnifying glass and they sort of, they can't do right or wrong. Um, what is your advice on how brands can prepare for this and deal with it? Mm -hmm. Great question. And it's something that I deal a lot with in my work is in, in the consulting capacity. I feel like a lot of brands are entering the sustainability space, but as you said, they're afraid that doing something might actually generate more critique of, well, mm -hmm. this is not enough. And to that, I would say that brands need to be aware of the pitfalls that they might experience in being called a greenwasher. And if you're not familiar with that term, greenwashing is the idea of co-opting the language of sustainability, using keywords like organic, green, sustainable, all of which have no industry established definition of what they mean. So everyone kind of has their free for all um, without necessarily following those values or ideals. And so I think what brands can do is hire consultants. Um, so it's not just to be a shameless plug, <laughs> but who are at the intersection of kind of understanding sustainability, but also a prowess for storytelling, especially with influencing and social media. Because I think a lot of the times brands often have a separate team for sustainability and a separate team for storytelling and messaging. And that often leads to using a lot of the words, but not really like telling, but not showing. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've come to learn um, throughout my time in the space is that sustainability at its core is about good storytelling, really taking consumers on that journey from the raw materials to the finished product. Mm -hmm. um, and so many times like I've talked to um, you know, marketing teams about inquiring deeper and they don't have the answers. And I think that points to one of the gaps um, in a lot of big brands is that there is that essential discord of not being able to speak um, in a very nuanced way of what that sustainability is really looking like in practice. Yeah, I think that's that's where the change collective comes in and that's where other um, conscious creators come in where they've got a platform that they can do the storytelling and they can they can speak about your brand in a way that relates to their audience and you know the story of your other brand's journey can really be understood mm -hmm. much further and wider um, mm -hmm. and i know that as you mentioned this week it is fashion revolution week as well as earth day tomorrow so i know that you've got a lot of virtual panels on your <laughs> to-do list this week back to back um, yeah <laughs> I actually saw on your Instagram stories yesterday, they just sort of kept coming, kept coming, <laughs> of the ones that you've got coming up. But um, are there any ways, any other ways that you're continuing your conscious fight from home? Yeah, um, most definitely. I think as a content creator, I really honed in on this time amid COVID to really create content um, that is educational, but also challenging culture. Um, mm -hmm. I think at this point, we're at a very strange 
moment in time where a lot of folks are kind of grappling with their own relationship to consumerism. Um, obviously, you're sitting at home and maybe you know, you're not going to be out buying things. That's one element. But I think brands are also realizing that their messaging can't ignore the state of the world anymore. And yeah. right now, that might look like coronavirus, but in other dimensions, it looks like the climate crisis and things like that. And so, yeah, I have been creating a lot of content at home that is um, a lot of IGTVs because I, I like that mm -hmm. longer form content that could really go into how to support garment workers at this time, um, interrogating our relationship with consumption in a time where you kind of are forced to, um, the complex nature of supply chains, all those things. I think it's been a very great time to kind of jump into more complex uh, conversations because the audience is there to listen at this point in time. Yeah, exactly. We, we've got time to to be educated in this space. Yeah. Um, I actually, I, I watched your IGTV on the impact that coronavirus is having on garment workers who, because of the lack of security, either financially or because of lack of protection from the state, they're being forced to keep working. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we think about sustainability, very often it's solely focused on the environment and not enough on the people um, and the workers. I, I listened to a podcast recently with Venetia Falconer and Aja Baba, mm -hmm. and Aja said something that really summed this up for me. She said, we can't have a movement that we consider better than before if we're leaving out a huge portion of the population. And so I, I'd love to know from you if you've got any advice on how consumers and brands can address these issues of inclusivity and really basic human rights during this current time and crisis. Yeah, great question. And I think Aja Barber is um, an ally in the space and mm -hmm. has done a lot of amazing work. And I think something that she has said um, at length that resonates a lot is if it's not ethical, it's not sustainable and vice versa, really pointing to the fact that our understandings of sustainability cannot be in a purely environmental right. Really, We really have to understand the human element of it and that is essential to sustainability. Yeah. Um, as far as the question about how brands and consumers can really address this current time, coronavirus has shown us the cracks in the systems. Mm -hmm. um, those that were always there but are now being paid to in a very special light. I think for brands that in the beginning of the crisis, you know, chose to stay open and things like that, that garnered a lot of negativity from consumers of, are you only prioritizing profit during this time? Um, I think now is the time to reconsider your supply chain because, you know, operations are kind of forced to come to a halt. Yeah. And especially degrowth for major brands. And when I say degrowth, I often raise his eyebrows um, and it's like, what do you mean? But I want to kind of expand on this idea of degrowth, which if you're not familiar, the, the concept of degrowth started in the 1970s, which was basically in response to mounting environmental and social problems, how can brands address that? The only solution they concluded was to produce and consume less. So that's kind of speaking to brands and consumers. And at the time, the proposal was con considered far too radical, but with today's climate crisis, um, a lot of major figures are really pushing this idea, people like mm -hmm. Noam Chomsky. And so, although once questioning growth was considered, you know, inherently anti-capitalist and the act of revolutionaries, not business folk. Now we can argue that, you know, it's not about shutting down business. It's about questioning a kind of growth that is better for the environment. Mm -hmm. And we could also argue that the degrowth movement has already begun because at a grassroots level, consumer demand is actively being transformed. In the apparel industry, you know, with fast fashion, that is just one example. But, you know, as we see that consumers are becoming so much smarter about the implications of brands and also becoming more aware of the ecological impact of clothing, it means that brands do have to do major changes if they want to kind of address that. And yeah. so growth means, you know, a lot of different things. It could be like following in the example of a brand like Patagonia that has committed to creating longer lifespans uh, mm -hmm. for their clothing and also creating business models that are inherently anti-growth in strategy in terms of offering uh, free repairs um, and things like that. And so Patagonia actually um, gave advice to other brands like um, 
I think Nike and Walmart potentially was the other one about how to pilot in-store uh, repair facilities. Uh, brands like Tesla created or released all of their patents in 2014 to kind of catalyze electric vehicle market. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a growing cynicism for the consumer base on whether brands are doing things just for marketing, altruism, or maybe a strange combination of the two. Yeah. But I think these sorts of initiatives are really good examples that are not just marketing ploys, but also strategies to kind of standardize a practice that is rooted in sustainability. And I think that's what consumers really want to see at this moment in time. Yeah, I totally agree. And I love your examples of that sort of brand collaboration of sharing their own industry or business secrets just for the better of people on the planet. Um, I think that's that's quite a nice positive note. And with that in mind, because I didn't want this discussion to be all doom and gloom. Um, I know there is a lot of negativity in the world today, but there's also a lot of people and organizations that are trying to turn that negativity around. Uh, what or who gives you hope? Yeah, um, I would say right now it's as weird as it sounds like I think what gives me hope is the fact that now is the time for fringe ideas to become normative. I think now is the time for reckless daydreaming and rampant idealism because we are all forced to come to a halt. And as much as so much is going wrong in the world and we really have to address who is being affected most by mm -hmm. this time. Um, it's also a time for reimagination, re in my opinion. And so that definitely gives me hope. That's great. Um, and then before we go to the Q&A chat box, I've got two more questions on my end just to keep ending this off on a positive note. Um, so the first is the mantra that I live by. And the second is my one number one piece of advice. Mm -hmm. So my personal mantra would be, don't be reactionary, be proactive, very apt mm -hmm. for our times. <laughs> and my number one piece of advice with the audience in mind is when it comes to sustainability, it's about show, not tell. Um, always keep that in mind. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you. Firstly, before we go to the Q&A, thank you so much for being on this chat. I think this has been super valuable for our brands and for all the other listeners. Um, especially given the current climate. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Chris. Awesome. Um, okay, so going into the chat box, there are a few questions about the true cost. Um, so we've got a question from Jess. What would your advice be for mainstream or heritage brands who are trying to change their ways to become more sustainable? It's not easy for them to start from scratch, so they have to work to make improvements to the packaging and supply chains they have in place. Mm -hmm. um, it can sometimes, sorry, it's a bit of a long one, but I, I think it's all to do with the same question. It can sometimes feel that they can't do right for wrong and accusations about greenwashing abound when they're trying to do their best short of ripping it up and starting again, what can they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it really articulates the major issues for brands that are trying to enter, enter this space. Mm -hmm. And I would say to that, I feel like often a lot of heritage brands, especially have such a strong brand identity that this idea of kind of showing the process of figuring it out is maybe not the most appealing at face value. But I think it's almost more damaging to kind of make certain commitments or promises but not really take consumers on that journey so i would say that as a brand is actively trying to grapple with reinventing its supply chain which i think a lot of brands are trying to do um take consumers on that journey and i think often the biggest critique is when a brand creates like a separate conscious collection but 90 percent of their profits are maybe made from the traditional way that's not necessarily sustainable or ethical mm -hmm. Um, and I think that often raises eyebrows because what consumers want to see is a holistic change in their supply chain. The ethos that really ground a company rather than just, just being like a corporate mm -hmm. philanthropic effort on the side. Mm -hmm. So think about holistic shifts and know that it's not going to happen overnight. And to some extent, there is going to be critique. But if we could really harness the power of industry thought leaders um, and folks that really know their stuff with sustainability to go on the journey with you and share that with audience audiences. Mm -hmm. That ed educational element is huge in this point in time. 
Great. I think that is incredible advice. Always start from the core and don't just sort of have these add-ons. Um, mm -hmm. And definitely reaching out to thought leaders in the space is very important. Um, okay, so the next question is from Louis. On show, not tell for brands on sustainability, what are your favorite examples that you're seeing right now? And that also yeah. echoes Joe's question, what brands are doing sustainability well? Mm -hmm. I would say Patagonia is a personal favorite and industry mm -hmm. um, leader that has not been afraid to show up to make statements about the environmental state of the U.S. Um, in face of certain policy to really telling consumers that when you buy something from us, we want it to last you a lifetime. And so really seeing their pieces as an investment. And I think that really goes back to what I'm saying of often the discourse in sustainability is, well, if you want to buy into this moral, you know, globalism of like being a good consumer buy this buy this buy this but if consumers are being fed a narrative that challenges this sense of mindless consumption they're going to trust that brand a bit more they won't feel mm -hmm. like they're constantly being sold to especially occupying a space as an influencer i think sometimes the hashtag ad hashtag sponsored creates a discourse in the audience if you're not really providing value, if it's just like a random product placement. Mm -hmm. So with me, it's always about how can this product placement inform and educate and inspire in some ways. And so I think those are kind of the leading pillars that brands should consider when thinking about their messaging, but also in what capacity they work with influencers in. Amazing. Um, okay, great. So on to the next question. So this is a bit, it's sort of in line with the same question, but uh, Katie has asked if you can let us know some of your favorite sustainable beauty brands that you use and fashion brands that you use. Yeah, so on sustainable beauty, uh, I know there's a lot of innovation happening in this space as well. I would say I really like the work of what Lush is doing. Um, I think they have very much championed that zero waste movement of like their packaging especially um, and things like that. So that has been a great thing that I think they were kind of leading be be before it became so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of fashion brands, I would say my favorite fashion brands are very small scale ones. Um, ones that you can kind of see on my Instagram and blog that I've worked with in the past, but I am a huge advocate for small batch production and artisan made production. So um, all the South Asian labels that are very unique, uh, very innovative in the use of natural materials and also thrifting and secondhand. I think that's nice. two domains that we need more love for. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Um, Okay, and then there's a question from Mary. For someone who is concerned about making sustainable choices but is very constrained by budget, are there any key brands you can suggest? Yeah, um, so I'm not sure if this question was referring to fashion specifically, but I would say that the most sustainable thing that one can do is one, look at your closet, see what you own, and two, thrifting and secondhand are two domains that you might write off as, oh, I can't find good things there, but I think um, the online space of thrift shopping has expanded exponentially as well. So you could really look for key brands that align with your aesthetic, uh, your size, your um, preferred color and things like that, which make it a lot more easier. Mm -hmm. There's also platforms like Depop and Poshmark. And I think that that sort of secondhand market is one a lot more accessible on a price point level, but also is very much addressing the fact that there is so much product already out there that we don't need to be buying new. Yeah. Um, so I would say that for sure. I think that's great advice. I, I've recently moved and I think when you can look at your closet, when you're packing it up and then unpacking it, you see just how much you actually have. Mm -hmm. So always better to look at what you have first, then go to what's already been created and then perhaps the sustainable brands and definitely a cheaper way of doing it. Yeah, most um, definitely. And then a question from Olivia. What brands would you love to collaborate with and why? So ones you haven't yet, but are on your list. Ooh, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, let's see, I think beyond just specific brands, because I don't think any come to mind of like, oh, I really want to collaborate with this brand. Um, 
I want to work with brands in a certain way where they can take me on a journey to the source of their production. Um, actually, a brand that came to mind, if you're familiar with Veja, they're that yes. uh, sustainable sneaker brand. Yeah. Um, they did an amazing campaign where they took some sustainability thought leaders to the Amazon, um, where a lot of their production is based, really thinking about like their source of their rubber and things like that. And I think that is an amazing way for sustainability thought leaders that talk about this stuff at length but don't always get the opportunity to go to the source to really provide valuable content to their audiences that are that is extremely informative and just entertaining to watch because I think that sort of travel with a purpose edge is also infused within that. Yeah. Um, so I would just say, yeah, more engaging maybe brand trips that are rooted in following the supply chain. Yeah, it's it sort of links to what you were saying earlier about the storytelling element mm -hmm. that's really telling the story of your brand and the journey mm -hmm. of the product. Um, okay, and then Cecily has a question. Sometimes it can be overwhelming seeing all the different labels between eco, environmentally friendly, sustainable, organic, natural, ethical. Is there any guide you'd give to consumers as to what we should be looking out for and what terms are often used when brands are greenwashing? Yeah, great question. The first thing I would say is don't be afraid to just ask brands, what do you mean when you say you're sustainable or ethical, especially on social media, because it's such a powerful tool in promoting brand accountability. Like, for instance, hashtag who made your clothes, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of certain certifications that can often guide consumers, um, I would say fair trade is a great um certification that you could look for that points to more ethical um, compensation practices. A B Corp is another great one. Um, in terms of the way a garment is dyed in a not as toxic way, Okio Tech certified is another common um, certification. And then I would say there's also a rise of third party um, certifications of organizations that are looking at brands from the perspective of waste, water usage, um, garment record rights, and environmental progressions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites is from Remake. Uh, their website is remake.world, and they are actually launching their own certification program of like making brands Remake certified, and they're not affiliated with any brands, so they don't have any uh, conflict of interest such as affiliate marketing so I think that's a very uh, objective source of information mm -hmm. coming from leaders in the sustainability realm. Great um, yeah I think it can often be a very confusing area with food it's a lot more um, obvious you sort of can see organic you can see free range but when it comes to clothing because it's so much more of a complex supply chain there's just so many labels you need to have to really yeah. be as transparent as possible when people are going to actually buy the product. Um, thank you for those websites, that is super helpful. And then we have a question from Karen. Are there any brands that are truly innovating and pushing the limits of sustainable practice in the fashion space? Lots yeah, I mean, the brands that I mentioned before, Patagonia, Veja, Lush, I think those are some of the bigger brands in the market that have pushed um, the limits. But I would say some of the most inspiring charts that I have personally seen is more mid-sized or smaller brands mm -hmm. whose, um, you know, their main priority isn't becoming this global brand necessarily. I think that kind of goes back to the idea of degrowth or, you know, really thinking about like when you have complete control of your supply chain, um, what does that mean in terms of your control and agency and making sure that everyone is compensated fairly is in a are producing in a way that is not so major in its scale that it has huge environmental impacts. Um, one brand that comes to mind is Tonelay. Uh, they were one of the first zero waste brands, meaning they were taking dead stock fabrics um, that were gonna be in landfills otherwise, mm -hmm. um, and creating creative patterns that meant there was no um, clothing waste. They were employing vulnerable communities um, for like decades and so really, creating a shift in terms of social mobility and thinking about the um, environmental considerations of their yeah. brand. I, I can't remember the names right now, but some of the most interesting brands or innovations that I've heard of recently is, is taking what would have been waste and turning it into a product. So like pineapple leaves and making them into pineapple leather or yeah. taking the grounded coffee and putting them into beauty products. I think 
that's super innovative because you're not creating anything extra you're just using what would have been thrown away exactly Um, and i think that points to this idea of circularity that Mm -hmm. brands are really honing into the fact that instead of seeing our role in fashion or any other industry is create consume and throw away how can you create a circular model where Mm -hmm. waste is seen as a direct resource and an essential part of the design process so we're creating closed loop systems Um, i think that's the future of all industries at this point completely agree Um, And then one final question from Georgie. So brands often gift influencers lots of product, many of which go to waste or are unused. What do you recommend doing when it comes to gifting? Great question. Um, Number one rule, ask. (laughs) I get a lot of um, PR companies often emailing me saying, we'd love to gift you something. And I'm quick to say, like, I'd love to consider what you're uh, gifting. Can you send me the product so I could actually make sure there is an aesthetic fit here? Um, Also, I think being more considerate about the packaging around, um, you know, influencer gifting Mm -hmm. is really great. Thinking about compostable packaging. Um, Mycelium is a great new product that's made of like mushroom fungi that is like um, compostable. Yeah, so just ask. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And on that lovely note, I think we're hitting our 45 minutes. Um, So guys, that was was amazing. Thanks so much, Jess. Aditi, I feel like I've had a full um, course there. It's amazing. (laughs) I feel totally inspired and educated. Um, So we're going to wrap things up. As I said, thank you so much. Uh, All of the details on the Change Collective, we're going to send on an email to everybody. Um, Make sure you follow Aditi Maya at Aditi Maya on Instagram. And you'll be able to follow all of the Change Collective progress. So tomorrow, Earth Day, we launch uh, with the Change Collective. So Aditi, thanks for being a founding member. Definitely adding some gravitas to the project. And Jess, you've made an incredible contribution for your own education. So stick with us. Follow us on Instagram and Whaler. Make sure you can see all the content coming in and we'll follow up with an email with all the details for further projects. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Aditi. Bye, everyone.